Ready to go? Okay, so I'd like to introduce Carlisle Brown, who is going to take over and uh, come on up here. Cause y so you can, and then I'll pass the mic. So we're gonna be on microphones so that uh, we can, uh, we're recording this, we're live streaming, so it's kind of a uh, new addition to the uh, intimate experience we're about to have in this room. So uh, I'll take it over, Carlisle. It's on. Oh, okay. We're on now. It's on. So we're just waiting for. Are we waiting for Mambula to join us on this? We will see her on the screen. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So we'll wait for her. Okay, well, I guess, yeah, I guess Ma Mabula will know uh, what it is we're talking about. So, uh, yeah, I guess I could start. Um, you know, the question is, um, what is the question? What is the, uh, how do we phrase it? What is uh, the African diaspora? What is Afro-Atlantic culture? And, of course, it's in context of this festival we're having, which is about a specific program, you know, that I initiated um, uh, about playwrights in the African diaspora. It comes from um, my my. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, my people are Geechees, um, Gullah people they call them, and uh, sometimes like rice eaters. And we are were always aware of why we were there in Charleston, South Carolina, um, because um, the Europeans did not know how to cultivate rice. And, you know, we always knew that we most likely uh, came from the people who were from what was called the Grain Coast uh, in uh, West Africa. Um, the, the language, there was a language, a um, patois kind of, uh, you know, hyphenated language that uh, um, these Charleston Sea Island people spoke, which was called Gullah. And it, it contains, we knew we probably came from the Grain Coast because many of the words that were mixed into Gullah were Mende and Timne words, which were people from that Grain Coast. So we knew we were African, and of course, that propelled, uh, you know, the family life. The Charleston people that migrated to New York, you know, were um, followers of Marcus Garvey and believed in, you know, their political philosophy was Pan-Africanism. And sort of what that means is that your identity is more expansive when you identify with being black people of the uh, Atlantic Basin. Um, it means that you understand that, um, that your people were enslaved from Africa and collectively all of us, and so those people, uh, that we, our ancestors, the ancestors of all the people born in the Atlantic Basin, in the New World, you know, products of the Atlantic slave trade. And we know that that enterprise uh, financed the Western world. So it's a larger way of looking at your identity, and it is really not so much biology, but an idea, right? So that doesn't mean like all black people are into this or even know that, but, you know, in the Camargo program, we're looking for people who lean into this social, political, historical phenomenon that made the world we live in. And, and, and those people that use that in their scholarly research and in their art, um, you know, uh, sort of embrace that as the truth. Um, and I think that we know that the, the transference in culture of what comes from Africa and it's transformed into the new world. Um, when we look at music, dance, religi religiosity, that connection is obvious. Right? But um, I wondered how that was related into uh, the narrative, and particularly performance 
when we're talking about cultures that originate, which are oral cultures in written language, and you know the writers are sort of griots that tell the story of the people that have you know, a very kind of interesting. So it's a different way of looking at the world. And um, uh, this young lady here, the, the author of We Take Care of Our Own, was one of the... One of the first fellows in which we um, to have these sort of conversations about uh, Afro-Atlantic culture in, you know, theater, which is a Western art form, we, um, you know, we promised people that we would give you a place where you could explore your craft, your voice, your Africanness in a beautiful Mediterranean, Mediterranean environment without the white Western gaze. That is without, uh, because just kind of way we exist in the Atlantic world structurally and politically, we we use a white lens to communicate in the world of the world, and so this is a place where, you know, black people did not have to, artists did not have to explain themselves, represent an entire world, but you know to just you know do their art and and express themselves in the way. And so we found out that, like, the work was really different. You know, when people, ca you know, when these people came here, you know, from the diaspora, they shared this s identity, this Afro-Atlantic identity, but they were different. They were from different places, they had different cultures, spoke different languages. And, you know, Amy um, Bola, we're just getting started. We're getting in the context of what you know about, like, Camargo. You've heard my spiel. You know what I must have told him, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, so um, you know, to kind of bring this all together, so I'll, I'll try to like just wrap up what my, you know, how this thing started, my idea. The things that we, we discovered, I discovered things all the time, right? And it was, we said, well, like, how do we make these, um, you know, we invite artists. Where do we find them? How do we, you know, get them? Where do we send these applications for the call, right? So you think of the Atlantic slave trade and, you know, that geography, you went, well, that geography is gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so, you know, just exactly how do you find their people, how are they connected? We finally asked the artist in an essay to just define what Afro-Atlantic culture was then to themselves. And we, first time we got four um, uh, artists from uh, Africa and four from the States. And Zaza here was one. And and then we'll we'll meet them and we'll get into sort of what the rest of the story is and maybe we'll all right. Okay. I'll do this and that'll be enough for me. Okay. Um you know, Zanibal Jala was a scholar, playwright, uh a um portrait photographer. Her academic and creative works have been conveyed through fellowships at the Sundance Theatre Institute. Institute of World Literature, Harvard University, Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, Highest Theater in Munich, something in French I can't read, the House of Writers in Switzerland. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in England and UNESCO Coalition of Artists for the General History of Africa. She's the author of award-winning plays, Onions Make Us Cry, Holy Night, and My Sultan is a Rock Star. Jalo is a postdoctorate researcher and lecturer at the University of Basel, Basel, uh, Switzerland, and uh, she is one of the principal investigators of the Sacral Architecture Africa Project. Her scholarly interests include the Afro-Atlantic, iconic criticism, the history of criminology, criminal anthropology, and material culture. How about that? <laughs> and um, Mabula, who is uh, in France, and um, Mabula, I, I just uh, say your last name to me again, please. Sumahoro. 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 Okay. She's associate professor of the at the University of Tours, and president of the Black History Month Association, dedicated to celebrating Black history and culture. She started at Bennington College, uh, Bernard College, the Bard Prison Initiative, Columbia University. A, a visiting professor of uh, Mellon Arts Project in 2002. Um, 
she, uh, I could go on and on, but she has written this um, wonderful book, Black is the Journey, Africana, the Name. Um, so, Mabula, can we start with you and you can tell us? Uh, sure. Sure, Caroline. Yeah. Tell us, um, how would you define Afro-Atlantic culture? Wow, that's a big question. Um, I would immediately use the plural form, Afro-Atlantic cultures. There are many sites that constitute this uh, uh, Black Atlantic space, let's say. Many sites, many populations, many histories, therefore many cultures, right? But we are talking about this global space um, that, as you mentioned earlier, that is born out of um, you know, the modern era in history that is born out of the forced displacement of enslaved Africans. That is to say people uh, of African descent that did not define themselves as African at the time. People who came from various groups and sites and communities and polities of the African uh, continent and that became black outside of the continent, right? So this uh, scattered and dispersed and uh, forcefully moved um, population uh, from the African continent to the Americas developed wherever they uh, ended up in the Americas cultures that simply were perhaps at first uh, extensions of their old ways, the ways that they uh, had developed and uh, practiced in their places of origin. And then the, those old ways were mixed, combined, transformed by the other cultures that they encountered once they reached the Americas. So these other cultures might be, you know, a mix of various uh, African cultures uh, from those various uh, African groups that I have just mentioned. And then there was also the encounters with European cultures. There were also, um, you know, encounters with Native American cultures, and this really, you know, this can constitute what we can today call this global Afro-Atlantic culture or cultures, as I said. So the ways uh, people have, I don't know, cooked, the ways people have prayed, uh, the ways people have um, expressed their spiritualities, the way people have buried their dead, the way people have mm. considered and imagined their futures, the ways people have managed to stay alive or not to stay alive, uh, all these things would constitute the cultures of this, uh, this Black Atlantic. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a gumbo. <laughs> it's like a gumbo. <laughs> yeah, it's the like gumbo is like the gumbo. right example. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. Illustration. Yes, uh, definitely. How would you express it, uh, Sarah? Well, it, it sure is a hot pot. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix. It's a rhizomorphic uh, make-up. It's constituted of um, several features. And one interesting thing is about it not being fixed. I do agree with Mabula in the sense that I wouldn't refer to the Afro-Atlantic uh, culture at in the singular. Mm. For the fact that it kind of um, homogenizes very distinct uh, features that are very important to to highlight in terms of um, the different kinds of diasporas and also the historical contingencies that led to this to the displacements or movements, be it voluntary or um, forced so it's it's kind of hard to define a s uh, to have one definition to something that could be seen through a lenticular lens lenticular in the sense that it has multiple realities each of them as important as the other but then with this movement as well, we have all sorts of diasporic entities that are all, all sorts of movements that come through either um, diasporic 
entities such as um, refugees, these are more recent ones, refugees or um, people waiting to be defined as or, uh, political status in terms of in indi indigence in different, um, in different forms, depending on the, on the con conditions that led to their displacement? Well, well um, you know, I, I, you know, that the, uh, the, the Camargo program, the program that we're in, you know, yeah. resulting in this, yeah. um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's so expansive, right? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. There's certainly like a lot of sort of mysteries and it isn't specific and it, it's fluid. You know, it's always moving and it's always changing because of that. And one aspect of the culture sort of influences another and makes something new. And it happens all the time. And it's filled with these things that I've always been fascinated with is it's filled with these kinds of mysteries about how did that thing from over there get over here, right? You know, in terms of a thing that was like meant to be oppressed somehow ends up over there, right? And nobody's... You know, there are all kinds of things. You find like some, some old brother in Alabama, he's called the cane, right? And somebody said, pow, that looks just exactly like a Yoruba cane. And he says, what's a Yoruba? You know what I mean? So that, you know, it is filled with that kind of mystery. And in terms of, you know, the elements. So you wrote a play out of Camargo, which was, I think, clearly a diaspora play. But it, it wasn't like, you wouldn't say it was a black play like we would, you know, say in America. You know, it had quite other sort of dimensions. So if you were to say uh, about your play, you know, what aspects of it carried the, uh, the Afro-Atlantic kind of dimensions? Well, I think there's just a, a character who is African who has encountered an intermixture by his choice of moving from Africa to Europe for studies and ended up being an astrophysicist in Europe and discovering things. I also wanted to highlight the fact that we have all sorts of diasporic entities and people often refer to or often think of the diaspora in form of a community or groups of people and not in indivi individualized as such. So I really wanted to kind of focus on an African on a lone journey that mixes with other cultures in a way that is sort of symbolic as well. Of course, while th thinking about um, existential issues such as gerontology or loneliness at the end of one's life and bringing memories of Africa with him. That's, that's interesting because I don't think, for me, it's not just the character, it's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. what, what, oh, you're, you're both, I'm looking at you. <laughs> what yeah. do you think, Mavola, about um, Zainab Booth's play in that regard? No, I think that um, Zenabu's play is really about, as she just explained, uh, I want to say rehumanizing uh, the people of African descent through that particular character. Because if we're talking about blackness, and particularly if we're talking about this Afro diaspora space, um, we need to remember that this, the, the very constitution of this diaspora was born of a disaster. This is the basic definition of uh, a diaspora, right? A scattering that follows a disaster. In the case of people of African descent, the, the disaster was the um, transatlantic slave trade. And part of that, um, let's say, diasporic process in the case of people of African descent was the, the process of dehumanization, the invention of those large groups, Africans, black, slaves, you know, inferior people, or enslaved people, I should say, inferior people, people with no soul, people who are, uh, you know, all similar people who have become um, 
I don't know, goods, possessions, right? So I think that the exploration in the contemporary world uh, by Zenobu of, uh, you know, somebody, in individual who comes from that, you know, ancient but still very present background and that manages to regain or, or, or perhaps in that is trying to draw the attention of, you know, the, the, the audience to the, you know, unique dimension of a human, uh, human being. And this is why I was talking earlier about pre-humanization. The invention of those large categories have contributed to the erasure of singularities. Somebody might be described as black, somebody might be described as African, but that's only one dimension of somebody's life, right? So I think that it, it is also important to deal with the, you know, the products of the history that we are interested in, the products of the cultures that we have mentioned uh, tonight, but those people, even though they belong to those new identities, they also remain human beings. And that, that implies, you know, a large spectrum of, uh, you know, complexities, of paradoxes, of contradictions, and, you know, their own desires, their own trajectories. And I, I think that this is what the play um, seems to be interested in, to tell somebody's life. And just because somebody is black doesn't mean that they don't have their own narrative and their, their own particular experience. And that matters too. Otherwise, we get lost in the diaspora, in the group, in the community, in the racial categorization. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, uh, you know, speaking as a playwright, I, I see the whole, um, she just uh, walked out the door there, but there was a, a, a writer here, a, a local writer, a friend of mine, who t talked about that play just in terms of its dramaturgy, right? That it is just not, um, and, and I worry about the, the writers and plays that have here is just, you know, this whole notion of dramaturgy. There are a lot of mysteries in this play, right? You know, which the play has no intention of answering, right? <laughs> you know, but it is only the character's relationship, their faith in those kinds of mysteries, which is kind of premates what I see as a spiritual quality of the play which does not exist, uh, you know, in average American plays, which don't take the time to sort of signify that thing. You know, there, there are things about uh, that which seems to attract uh, artists that I, I know I'm aware of, you know, uh, in, in, in a way of storytelling, you know, which it isn't, doesn't even really have to be about blackness or whatever. It has sort of an Africanness you know, to it, like I say, like the gumbo thing. You know, one of the things that we want to say, uh, you know, the thing about the white gaze is sometimes the cop is in your head. You know what I mean? You're going like, oh, well, what do they, what will they think? You know, how will they, how will they sort of like, sort of like kind of respond to that? When, in, and when I look at the critical world, like white people tend to, or the Western critics tend to um, put a lens on it which makes them comfortable which makes them know, makes them say, well, I'm the smartest one in the room, well, I know what this place should go to Broadway or kind of whatever. And this is something that just limits and plagues writers of color, you know, whatever diaspora they come from. You know. And that's one of the things that we wanted to probe in the cultural diaspora and look at that in terms of work, is that like, what is that thing that comes from you, no matter what shape it is or sort of what, you know, what kinds of, and in your play, I find, you know, these mysteries, you know, the, uh, you know, I'll tell you, you know, like we were sitting around, we said, he's the Panopticon, you know, so what the hell is that? You know what I mean? Like, you know, but, you know, his response, his need for the Panopticon is really a human thing that we could understand. And your play kind of gets beyond the, you know, every time we would go in this play, we'd say like, oh, what the hell is that? What are you doing? You know? So we look for the action, right? What is the action in the play? You know, what are they trying to do as human beings? Are you trying to get his attention? Are you trying to <laughs> insult him? You know, what is that sort of human thing? And it always came through. Look, whoa, there's the play right there, you know? And I just, that was the thing that I, I don't know. What, what's your response to that? Do I sound like I'm insane? <laughs> no, Am you I don't. <laughs> no, you do not sound like you're insane. 
But uh, another thing I wanted to add to that was um, the idea of transfers. When we talk about transfers of bodies, it's not just bodies, but ideas. There's um, something called uh, corporeal semiology that we uh, embodied knowledge that comes through. So with most of the things that these characters have in common would be, s would be things they carry within themselves, things that are not tangible, that cannot be seen nor um, understood from anyone else but people who have lived, ha have had lived experiences of such transfers. And when you talk about things moving as well from one point to the other, I think about, I, I work with diasporic objects, for instance, from West Africa to, to um, elsewheres, several elsewheres. And in terms of how things take on newer meanings or have added meanings onto them, objects, people, ideas, evolve or keep evolving in the diasporic space. So here within this tiny uh, configuration of a, of a nursing home or of a, an older people's home, we have the characters, you know, influencing each other, changing, uh, metamorphosing through their different experiences. And what comes through would be what they embody, which is the diasporic experience. They have left their various homes to go through life collecting, just like uh, uh, rolling stones that gather moss from, <laughs> different, from different points. And in a way, the identity or the identification of each character is really totally unfinished as they go along which is also what the diasporic entity, wherever they are, wherever they are from, continue to hold, like it's, it's, it's nonstop, it, it just keeps moving. And through that, I, I, I think it's just this kind of chaos, this kind of unsettling um, feeling that makes up a diasporic character, a diasporic culture, or a diasporic object, for instance, that moves from museum to museum, that makes, and people perceive them differently as well. So I, I would come back to the lenticularity in looking at things as well. And this can be through, through different lens, lenses. Each character is seen differently from, by, by an audience member you know, I've heard people interpret uh, Yusuf's character differently in a way that even makes me as a writer wonder, oh really, so that's what this is about the character. So like you say, li like you said earlier, the idea of having, of reading them through and through is impossible because that's what the, the diasporic condition does to any diasporic entity because there's no fixity, there's nothing that's constant. You just keep revolving, evolving, and having several iterations to your person and your thoughts and your ideas. So in a way, it, it comes off as um, somewhat schizophrenic, where you're one thing one minute and you're another thing the next minute. So it's kind of interesting because um, I live that life as well, as someone who has multiple realities in the sense that I have, I have Africa, I have West Africa, I have Nigeria, and I have Brazil. I live in Switzerland, and I move around quite often. So the idea of home too is an illusion, it's an, il to borrow from illusion theater, <laughs> is an illusion in a way that, you know, it becomes a bit muddled up sometimes where you begin to wonder. And when people ask, where are you from? Where is home to you? I begin to, to wonder, depending on, the s on who's asking, 
I give them the answer they want. <laughs> and it's, even for me too, I, I ask myself that quite often, and I've come to realize that, well, there's no answer to, ha to having a fixed identity. Okay, well maybe, that's, maybe that's not the, the quest, maybe it's the, it's the search, that's the point. I, you know, um, you know uh, I, I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about you know, your, uh, your, your experience in terms of language that we talked about before, you know, when you, when you say that um, my, my, mother's, my mother tongue is, is not my mother's tongue, you know, and how that, that discourse then relates to you know, language, your experience with language. Um, so I think my experience with language might be similar to what Zinabu has just described. You know, these uh, perpetual movements, these displacements, these reconfigurations, these also this question, the centrality of the question of home, that is to say the question of origin, the point of departure, the point of expected return, right? Um, it's not simple when you're talking about diaspora. In the case of the, you know, the history and the cultures that we're interested in, the point of departure might be uh, obvious, but even the concept of Africa is a not so very obvious uh, concept, right? Are we talking about Africa, the continent, or are we talking about all the different, you know, polities that have existed throughout the continent since the beginning of time, right? So even Africa itself as a term is really an, an idea, right? And sometimes even an ideal. So that would be the point of departure. But once the movement begins, we never know where it's going to end, right? And so these, these trajectories are also are going to be the trajectories of people, of communities, but of, of peoples, I should say, but they're also going to be the trajectories of languages, right? So languages will be lost, will be transformed, will be reinvented, will be regained, lost again, right? So I wrote in the book about my individual particular relationship to my mother tongue. And so my mother tongue is Jula from West Africa, and Jula in particular from the Ivory Coast, where my family is from. But Jula is, is a language that I do not speak, that I've heard all my life, but being born in France, uh, being surrounded by French-speaking people, I think that the French language took over the Jula language. And I cannot say that I never heard uh, the Jula language, as I said, it's simply that it lost, it was defeated by uh, you know, the French language. And then comes another language that I select, that I choose as an individual when I start traveling. It's the English language. And the, that English language becomes unexpectedly um, a, a sort of language of freedom. The language that I choose, that I select, that I pick, a language that is convenient, the, a language that is widely spoken, a language that places me in communication and exchange conversation with other communities from the uh, Americas. But it's most importantly, I believe, a language that is devoid of you know, any emotional attachment, if not mine as an individual, right? The English language allows me to stay away from French matters and to stay away from Ivorian and Jula matters. It's not the language that I have lost. It's not the language that I'm supposed to speak, but I don't speak. It's not the language uh, that um, connects me to some ancestry whose origins has been troubled because of that movement, right? So because of all these things, this is why I said, or this is why I came to the conclusion that I have a mother's tongue, I, I have a mother tongue, but I do not speak a mother tongue. And that I, the, the language that I speak the best is French, but French is not my mother, right? And because of that configuration, I found refuge, I found solace maybe in another language that I, that I, that I uh, took possession of and that is a little distant and disconnected from you know, the existential, historical, and cultural tensions that we are discussing. So this is what it means. 
um, I don't I don't speak my I don't share um, um, the language spoken by my mother and by my parents, but my parents do speak French, and I speak something else too. So it's again this back and forth between the the collective and the individual and what you manage to do with this chaos that is not I don't think that should not be solely understood as as a negative thing. Maybe the diaspora can be the home. Yeah, I, you know, I actually, well, yeah, I actually think so. Um, you know, that... Uh, Maybe you want me to clarify, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. The movement, the in-between, the constant evolution, the fluidity, that, the, the fluidity, that can be the home, too. And that can be more comforting than the idea of simply having lost and, 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 and trying to go back to something that will be forever lost. But just because it has been lost in that manner, it doesn't mean that it has not evolved in other manners. So uh, I made my peace with this question of, of, of home, and home is the motion. Is it emotion? Motion. The is motion. In the motion, yeah, yes. Right. Right, that's right. Yeah, it's that's that's um, uh, uh, you know what's that brother from uh, Junebug? He said it's not the size of the waves, it's the motion of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> you know that kind of makes it work. Well, you know, um, you know, of course, uh, this idea of uh, yeah, you know, migration. I mean, like you know, always moving, and it you know it transcends you know class and circumstances and kind of condition and but throughout the human history of these sort of moving someplace and changing and reinventing yourself is um you know is a kind of a, a creative dynamism that like you know moves the world in a forward direction hopefully in the arts in terms of a positive direction and i think you know understanding uh understanding your place in that is your own place. I mean, you know, I find when these writers have come to Camargo to be, you know, listened to for it to be okay to be who you are, um, you know, it seems to be a thing which is not, you know, accessible to everybody. You know, it seems to be, you know, the people from the bi diaspora talk about it in similar ways. You know, like we talked to some French playwrights there who talked about they didn't feel like they had, you know, any spaces, you know. And, but yet, um, like, Dumba had a very different way to, people had different ways to deal with these problems than certainly I would. People had ideas that were effective, which hadn't occurred to me in a million years. And there was so much to learn from each other about ourselves. And, and to be able to kind of, you know, not have to have to have any rules or kind of confines, you know, just because we, you know, trusted each other. There seemed to be that idea, that embrace of whatever Atlantic culture was, just had us greet each other with love and acceptance. And we had just a great time and we made great, you know, great art, you know. And, and for me, like, you know, well what things can we pick up that we can replicate this? Move it on. Yeah, and um, if I might add something to what Mavala said about uh, chaos and the unsettlement that comes with you know the being with moving around, I'd just like to add that the African diaspora has a particular conundrum that it deals with in terms of color and how how the black body navigates this wouldn't be how any other body navigates these spaces, which adds a layer of challenges to the idea of being human. You talked about uh, dehumanization earlier, Mabula, and I think about the concept of the human that has not been quite all inclusive, not everyone, is sort of qualified to be considered human. And it's something uh, Gilroy talks about, infrahumanity, being human but not quite human, not human enough to have access to certain things. And it is quite 
glaring even with today's uh, movements and migrations and all of that, especially in times of humanitarian crisis, which bodies are the last to be considered even if they're, they're even if they were on the priority list, which they often are not, they would be probably the last to be considered in any form of evacuation. We see that with the different wars going on and how black bodies seem to be the least considered bodies when it comes to evacuation or even border crossings. So well, in you know, I, I hear what you're saying. But I guess like sort of like what I'm saying is, you know, the, the fact that like, well, um, from my Gullah people, I never felt that way, right? I mean, I was oppressed, but you know, I wasn't the problem. I mean, you know, I was like a human being. So I never, I don't, people are made to feel that way perhaps, but I, I've never felt that way. And you know, um, uh, geez, you get over with these names, Hunter, um, Charlene Hunter Galt, you know, who used to be on, I don't know many of you remember, used to be on PBS for like, you know, many, many years. She was one of the black students that like, you know, um, integrated the University of Georgia, right? And um, she had, there were, there were just, I think, about two young ladies who were there who were, uh, you know, integrating, and, and the guys were like in town, but they lived in apartments, you know, they had to put him up somewhere in the University of Georgia. And she was saying that, like, uh, you know, at this this book she had just written, she was at, at Mixed Blood. She had a, you know, a talk back with the audience. And they said, well, like, what, you know, was it terrible? She said, well, you know, they didn't really want me to be with them, you know. So, you know, they put me in an apartment, you know, and they didn't want to eat with me. So that apartment had a kitchen. You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, and she said, you know, it was actually, I didn't really want to be with them either. So it was actually, you know, pretty nice. You know, it was not terrible. And so, and she said, well, were you afraid? And she said, no, because my history protects me. Right? And, and I mean, the continuity of these people that have moved around, the continuity that they are people like you, that there's something that they shared, that they survived, is something that can also be integrated into mm -hmm. the movement, what you have to do. Because that's what we have to teach each other. Absolutely. How to survive, you know, how to, how to contend with these struggles, you know, uh, how magnified they might be. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. One kind of works towards surmounting these challenges you know, but they, they are there, especially um, in such situations now where you have lots of migrants from sub-Saharan Africa and Africa in general, where um, there's a lot of dehumanization going on, especially with them. They, they are seen as um, just things that are not worth being bothered about. And when you think about the African diaspora also, it's of also thought of in terms of black bodies, which uh, I, I talked about recently. And it brings to mind, um, I think it was in the 1980s, uh, this song was released by, um, what's his name, Peter Tosh. As long as you're a black man, you're African. And recently I've had to, <laughs> does anyone know that song? African no. by Peter Tosh, <laughs> and and I I th <laughs> I think about that as well, and and think about uh, North Africa and the Berbers and how Africa and blackness are sort of interchanged in a way. And Mabula, you you talk about that in your book. Why not the Af why why not the black diaspora, for instance, and why African? Well, you know, definitely, you know. Uh, you know, blackness is associated with, you know, African, what we're talking about, you know, the African diaspora. Um, but then not all blackness is associated with that, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's really something you subscribe to. It's an idea. So, you know, not all black people are like, you know, painted with that brush. And there's some people that like, you know, 
uh, you know, in Bahia, in Brazil, that are African, that are whiter than somebody, the whitest person in this room. So it is expansive. There isn't any kind of simplistic, you know, answer answer to it. I guess what I'm, you know, staring at is, you know, uh, looking at us through, through uh, qualified in a little corner that has to do with like making art, right? You know, and how you know that shapes us. And I think for one, like part of making art, the art that we make, which is the most influential culture in the world. Uh, exist because of that resistance, right? Without that resistance, we w there would be no blues, right? You know, there'd be no Muddy Waters or Ray Charles or anything without responding to those oppressive conditions. Yeah, but it's quite interesting. What do you say about that, Mabula? I, um, I would say I agree with what you just said, Carla, but, but I would say that it's not only responding to you know this domination and this oppression mm. it's just by simply being and by i don't know meaning to be on one's own terms um that produces the beauty and the treasures and uh, and, and and that produces the resistance but not the resistance that locks anyone or any community in the gaze that you mentioned so many times um you know, rightfully today. But just to hmm, express oneself freely despite the constraints, despite this oppressive gaze, uh, to reaffirm constantly again and again some, someone's humanity, some collective humanity, and that is what has produced beauty, right? So it's, I totally right. agree with you, but I, I would simply not frame it uh, as, you know, responding. It's just being, people being constantly said, you're not a human being, just like Zenabu said, you're not a, hu a human being, you're not worth living, you're not worth being saved. You are going to die first, right? This is what negative racialization creates, who gets to live, who gets to die, right? And who will be in, you know, in the priority list or list or not the priority list. So despite this environment on a daily basis, reaffirming, uh, reasserting your humanity. I'm human, I'm human, I'm human. And I'll play music, I'll write plays, I'll write poems, I'll sing, I'll, I don't know, I'll work, I'll be a, a handyman or I'll be into, uh, you know, crafts, whatever it is and the way I want, because this is, you're trying to make me, you're trying to make me, or you're trying to make us something that is simply not true. You're wasting or using all that energy to uh, drill into our brain that we are not human. But did that energy that you spend on doing that, on doing that is the very proof that we are human. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to design uh, all those strategies and all those methods and all, all those laws and all those various treatments to dehumanize us. It would be taken for granted. Even when we talk about the African diaspora and the first encounters between European, Europeans and Africans, there was no doubt about the humanity of the people who were um, established on the African continent. There were treaties, there were negotiations, there were, you know, authorization, there were business transactions even, right? It's only when the trade um, developed and increased that there needed to be some legitimization of that, um, of those inhuman, increasingly hum inhuman transactions particularly through the Middle Passage, right? To pack people in that manner, that, that, like that was the novelty. So you need to, uh, you know, to bring some philosophy in, you need to bring a discourse, and you need to convince yourself that the way you are transporting um, human cargoes through the Atlantic does not affect those populations because they are not humans. But at first, when you needed to get, uh, you know, those, those enslaved people, you signed deal, you had contracts, you were dealing with kings, queens, or the heads of the various polities, and there was no question about the humanity of the people there. 
Never. So this dehumanization is a process, is a construction, and it has, um, this is when I come back to you, uh, Carly, this is what has always been contested, and this is what has always been proved wrong. People have behaved like human, and they, um, I don't know, for some reason, that domination has fueled the creativity, as if the dis it, 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 it's as if it had become an act of despair to, you know, in urgency, reaffirm your humanity. And that has fueled the arts. Well, you know, as you know, I, I, uh, I spent uh, 20 years of my life being a, a, a sailor, a 19th century sailing vessel. And I've given a lot of, and read a lot and given a lot of thought about the mechanics of the slave trade. You know, and, and if you look at the maritime world in the 19th century, it was the driving economic force, you know, it, you know it kind of into play, you know. And so when you think of, you know, depraved or dehumanizing people, you know, they are those people, you know, that, you know, that did that kind of oppression, you know, for money. It was capitalism. It was the way of the world. You know, everybody who breathed was complicit in the trade. It made enormous amount of money, like oil today. It was everywhere, right? And of course, you know, part of that suppression of that is it says something that's pretty horrible about all humanity again. You know, just the way in which slaves were put into slave ships and, you know, it's like a long story. The insanity of when uh, the, the British uh, went to, uh, no, for some reason they abolished the slave trade by doing a buyout for the planters which wasn't paid out until 2017. I mean, that is, yeah, when, when, when you know, the British abolished slavery, they had to pay out, they buy out the planters. That's how it worked. That was the only way it was going to work. Pay them for that. And they took a loan from the Rothschilds and whatever and the English people for more than a hundred years to pay off that debt. And it just had, that's how much money was involved. You know, we talk about reparations, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> so, you know, so I think if you're aware of that history, um, at least you could hold yourself up and not saying that the, the non-humans are the people who are doing this to me, right? And, and that takes, you know, that takes communication and, and knowledge. I mean, the other thing that I've learned from the slave trade, a friend of mine you know, wrote a pretty good book, it's called uh, Black Jacks, about black sailors in the 19th century. Uh, this enterprise, you know, like the sailors who worked, they would take anybody, they didn't care you were black or white or whatever, I mean, your job was just horrible, you know, just anyway, you know, to transport these human goods, you know, across the Atlantic. And, but it was sophisticated. It made sure that it put people of different language groups in the same cargo hold, so they had no means. It was always thinking about, you know, social control for the dollar. That was always the sort of thing, and the mechanism gave uh, rise to extenuating things like shipbuilding, just, just, you know, to sort of solve the problems of maximizing the people that you could pack in. So. Um, you know, uh, my perspective comes from, I think, you know, as we look at the Atlantic slave trade, we know that enterprise is, uh, you know, not the thing that is conveyed, like the happenstance thing that happens once in a while, you know, that it is our, our influences. I don't know what I'm saying. Well, I, I, I don't know wh where you're at. I wanted to, you guys have done most of the talking. What would you like to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, more about this thing, which is, after, I, you know, obviously expansive and sort of, you know, really, I find it like, you know, really interesting. So, um, you know, you, both of you guys are, in, you know, are involved in artists and supporting artists when we, when we came to uh, Cassis, mm -hmm. you were have you were part of the Afro Fest, in which you were uh, dramaturging all these plays, 
But, well, plays by, <laughs> plays by the uh, African diaspora, right? You know, so um, tell us a little bit about that experience and what what, what Eva Dumba is trying to do. So, I think the idea um, in Cassis was really about uh, the idea was to have, you know, people in conversation and people being able to listen and read one, listen to one another, read one another, and accept um, everyone, or accept each one's particularly, particular circumstances, uh, backgrounds, um, specificities, right? Local cuisines, if I may say. We're talking about this global ensemble that the, the African diaspora is, but within that global ensemble, there needs to be uh, attention paid to the local experiences. And in those local experiences, the individu individual experiences, just like Zenabu uh, mentioned uh, earlier, or did in, in her work. So I think that in Cassie, it, it really was about um, adopting or recognizing to a certain extent a common language or common grammar but they also leave space for um, everybody's, let's say, positionality, everybody's you know, particular location, everybody's uh, imaginaries, everybody's, um, as I said, circumstances. And, 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 and it was about finding a balance where there would be room for everyone and where there would be no strict boundaries that would exclude anyone on this, um, I don't know, on some type of imagined uh, black uh, badge of honor or what, I don't know, you know, like we don't want to reproduce um, those categories that, that systematically leave people out. And it's, it was also, and I think you touched on it um, a little uh, earlier, Carla, I, it, it really also was about freeing people um, you know, escaping the gaze, uh, finding their voices, um, you know, feeling free to express whatever they had to express, not um, overthinking or not being scared about fitting in, not fitting, uh, you know, fitting in the diaspora or, um, I don't know, challenging or upsetting, you know, some white gaze or, you know, just, just to, to reconnect and reunite and, and, and authorize their, their, the val validity and legitimacy of their own voice. So Cassie and the Camargo Foundation being such a, you know, like strikingly beautiful sites and, and, and places that, that are, um, you know, that foster um, I don't know, artistic expression or, 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 or you know, it, it really was about fostering an environment that would uh, give birth, that would produce those expressions, uh, but expressions as free as, as possible. So the, the diversity, the variety, uh, the different angles, um, the different, you know, tastes, that's precisely what diaspora is and this this is precisely what i think that the cultural diaspora program is, is doing the diaspora does not unite in similarity it unites in the dissimilarities <laughs> it unites in the recognition of the diversity people are in this together not because they are alike yeah right right it might look alike but <laughs> yeah yeah so you, uh, well, Bob, i can say Bob, about you Well, it's happened. It's happened. Twi it's happened twice, and um, you know that's um, money thing. You know, and organizational thing. But it's happened twice. Pardon? Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm writing about um, another. Afro diasporic entity character 
um, a Brazilian artist called Otto Bispo do Rosario, who lived in a, who lived in an asylum for 50 years and created very beautiful work while he was there. And I'm writing a play in his honor because he was very um, he was a very dynamic character who believed that uh, he heard voices telling him to document the world through things he found. Since I work with material culture, I thought that was really brilliant. And I went, he, there's a museum in his honor in Rio de Janeiro. And he was also very poetic in the way he spoke. He was majestic. So I'm writing a play based on his life and his work. That's what I'm doing now, and I find his life fascinating. And to bring it back to the African diaspora, he had never visited. He never visited Africa in his lifetime, but he always had memories of an Africa he never visited, and this was quite visible in his in the art he created. He made his ideas of the map of Africa, for instance, and also um, used ships, water as a symbolizing ide ideology for his art. And it's, it's beautiful, you should look him up. He's, he, he gave a couple of interviews and you can find them on YouTube, but in Portuguese. And yeah, I'm, I'm working on that now and it's almost finished. So it's all about the African diaspora for me. Yeah, his art was very beautiful, by the way. If you kind of just sent us an early version of the script of, of images of his art, it was uh, fantastic, just creative. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and I, I would also add that the diasporic individual is also somewhat universal in how how they live and how they interact with with other cultures, other people, other things, other languages, for instance. So it's learning how to live as one goes along. I understand what you mean about universal. Um, I find that in art, at least in writing, you know, I find that a dangerous word <laughs> or a dangerous concept, you know, because um, often it means universal is the dominant culture, like what happened to them, what happens in their world is universal, you know, that like represents kind of everything, you know, and it's a kind of a complicated word because, you know, in terms of creating, at least a narrative anyway, you only get to the universal by, by getting into the specific, you know, just what Abdullah says about what is local, you know, what is of interest, you know, what is down here in your, the world of your own nitty gritty, you know, and. Oh yeah, no, I, t I totally, un I totally understand. It's just often, um, in terms of uh, 
writers from the diaspora, um, work is said to be not universal for reasons that we cannot understand, and there are kind of people in there, you know, it is, you know, it's like a code word, or like you're screwing up, or you're not, you know, so that, so I didn't mean it. It's just like, when you said the word, I was like, what? But I, I think <laughs> if, I may, if I may say, even though I'm not hearing the questions from, from the audience, but if the, the, the discussion is um, around this notion of universalism, I think that what Zenabu is doing in our play is very interesting because you know, creating characters who are contemplating the end of their, 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 their life, right? Who are contempl contemplating death, who, are, who find themselves themselves in a nursing home that is universal and that will like that that approach and contemplation of death is a shared uh, like universally shared common experience and that does not or perhaps that might help the audience to <laughs> remember that you might be black or you might be african or you might be from this black or african diaspora and just like anybody else you're going to die or just like anybody else, you're going to have a reflection on the life you have led. That's universal. And that the life you have led, um, you, you will have led, is of course shaped by the particular, uh, you know, circumstances or the particular affiliations that have, um, that you have encountered throughout your life. But that, that uh, I, th I think that this is, um, I mean, the setting of, of Zenabu's play itself is, is great in that manner. It's great in that manner. Just wanted to comment on the video introduction that really set the stage for the play and understanding your point of view. So I'm glad you found it. Well, thank you so very much. Um, because it's something I discussed with Carlisle about. I wasn't for the video, and he thought it would be a good idea to integrate it. I, it's something I made from years ago and I was cleaning out my old laptop and I found it and I thought to share it with Carlisle since he was working on this play. Oh, look what I found. This has started from <laughs> a long time ago. And then he thought, no, we should, we should include it. And I had this idea that we should polish it up a bit. It was just a school project and um, it was a long time ago and he said, no, we wanted it that way. And, um, so that, that was how the video came, came about to becoming part of the play. It wasn't an initial um, idea to have it in there. Yeah, she didn't, she didn't say, like, screen my play. You know, it doesn't say that in the beginning of the script. Um, well, you know, I thought it was just um, a really innocent thing. I just thought it would be interesting to, for the audience to see the sentiment of uh, the writer and who the writer is, you know, particularly inaccessible. And then, you know, sort of see the play. It seemed to like segue together kind of pretty good. So I thought it was really complimentary information. And then, of course, it was, um, you know, it's, it's kind of very meditative and, and gentle and stuff like that. And the play opens with, you know, Richard going, Into the raging seas, fellas! And then we, and then we blast along with a play that moves. Um, it moves quite crisply, and, and uh, you know, there's, um, yeah, yeah, the way the energy and the movement of the play is really, um, it's really quite nice in how it goes around. It's not a very long play, but the way it, it projects you into the end of the life and, I don't know, says what it wants to say and, and then gets out of there. But, you know, highlighting who you are, um, you know, illusion, we do new work and sort of highlighting who the author is in the context of the play and how she felt was, that was good, right? You guys like that, right? Uh, 
actually it just made me think in terms of um, not only gives insight into the author, but then it almost um, it gives a lifespan. And so starting with what that young person, which these gentlemen at one time were a young person and had passions or you know things they loved and so so you get a whole life span also um, not th the gentlemen give their own lifespan but it also I think adds to that I I was thinking about this question of, of the universal and, and, and wanting to kind of come back and, and, and root it into, into the, the specific, right, of, of, of the diasporic, of the Afro-Atlantic, and, and thinking about um, how, how I see that, uh, considering how, um, <laughs> Carla, you, you mentioned that it, 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 it may not be uh, what, what we may consider um, a, a black play in a, in a, in a conventional sense, uh, and, and by that I, I, I took to understand as perhaps um, uh, featuring black actors or a black cast, of, uh, and, and that, that was what I took from the comment you said earlier, but to me, I, I one, for instance, one scene that, that stood out to me a lot was um, the, the reading of the blood and seeing the geographies within the blood, and there's something there uh, in very special because um, as uh, Youssef and, and Munso are, 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 are gazing at, at, this, at this dripping of blood and in it seeing these geographies, um, ba is it Bajan, right? Ba Bajan um, is, is confused, right? At what, what, what is it that they're seeing as if they must be mad, right? And, and to me, there's something I guess perhaps epistemological here with regards to how uh, a certain there there is a certain knowledge there, right? That 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 may not be evident or legible to an, uh, someone to to someone who's who's not quite tuned into that, uh, who may not be looking for that, right? And and to me, I guess the the, the Afro-Atlantic epistemology if, if, if we're going to put it that way could be seen in the play with that those kinds of special moments right and 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 another sort of um, poetic layer that I appreciated was this uh, aspect of, of uh, Yusef gazing into the stars um, and and having that internal fear of the panopticon right of being surveilled yet uh, himself being uh, someone who who gazes right, whose gaze is cast not at not at uh, at, at fellow humans, but at but in, into a search to the to the light right to to nur right, and 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 that is a uh, something also that that I was I was thinking about as as uh, Yusef's um, life comes to an end, and to me that's that's uh, that. To me, it, it's clear that the play is, is suggesting that 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 search for Nur is is complete now. The the, the Yusef has returned home, right? The the ancestors may may be welcoming home welcoming him home, right? And so, those sorts of elements, to me, are are, are the Afro-Atlantic diasporic sort of elements that I saw to appreciate. You know that 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 you need to see um, in 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 a way that that isn't going to be a sort of in your face, a black play that, that you know, with, with an all black cast, uh, if that, you know, if that, if that makes sense. So. Well, I guess so also sort of, you know, in the manner of the storytelling, right? You know, just the way, you know, you, you just said you associate, you know, Yusuf, you're convinced of this thing with the, the relationship between his panopticon and his uh, astrophysicist. They're just things in the play that like, invite you to imagination, extrapolate on what they mean, you know? And, and then we turned out, we found out like, well, you know, that fits if you want, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's kind of like sort of open in that way, you know, we would do things like, well, we would say like, well, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> but then, you know, when you played the scene, if you played what the characters were doing, 
it all became clear, and then you could do it. And then, and then, and then in the end, it didn't matter what it meant, except what it meant to you. It was a way for you to engage in the play in terms of, you know, how you saw it. But it still had this, this movement, you know, about these, you know, these characters. I mean, in some ways, it's really. It starts with the, you know, the baptism. We want to get baptism, and that's the plot. That's where the trouble begins. You know, <laughs> they get baptized. You know, and they, you know, they get sick. You know, and they die. You know, one of them dies. You know, and that's kind of. But, but there's a there's a real lush journey that like that follows it that you can enter into with that with with, with the plot. And I think for me, um, it comes from you know this this African writer who just has that kind of imagination, you know, who, you know, just like you said about, you know, the guy who dreams of quicksand. How do you, how do you respond to someone who has such dreams? <laughs> you know? And so your play is kind of like that. Way. How do you respond <laughs> to someone who sees the world in this way? I mean, that is just as much about, you know, seeing a piece of art because it comes from a person, you know. That's why like, AI doesn't work. I mean, we make art, we as people make art for other people, you know, and and it's individualistic, and this play is like that. It's a, it's a unique thing of its own. I mean, true, it's universal in kind of its themes, but it itself is a thing of its own. And that thing has diasporic influences, which I think, you know, if we, you know, had a school of studying that for manuscripts and stuff, you could probably say that they are similar elements that we could pick out and describe. But now I'm I'm an artist, not a scholar, but as I read things, I think I think I think, you know. <laughs> that, you know. Did you want me to respond to that? Okay. Hey, you know, <laughs> it's an open room. You could say anybody could say whatever they want. No, I'm just <laughs> because I think we're out of time. I see someone signaling. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you, because I, I do feel like much of the play would be part of who I am, like you say, as much as I don't like to feel that vulnerable and put myself <laughs> out there, which is why I there didn't want is. the, I, I really <laughs> didn't want the video out, but <laughs> now it's out, and um, yeah, there, there are several ways of being diasporic in the world, and um, all three characters are diasporic characters. I don't know if that w that came through as yeah, well. Yeah. So that was one thing they all had in common as well. And as as a diasporic entity myself, I I share in certain of the uh, I share in some of those um, some of those worries as well, and some of those complications, some of those uh, schizophrenic moments of questions that do not have answers to them and it's just the way we roll yeah well, just the <laughs> way we roll. well you know it's one of the things you know maybe why they're you know they're critics and other people that like you know look at people's work i mean some of it's subconscious you know you don't kind of you know know it in there you know but like um you know walking backwards to tuba you know the sort of the idea it evokes things that you know you just don't find another you know, it creates another tapestry without having some monologue about, like, you know, what's going on in Tuba. You know, it's just, you know, uh, the relationship to spirituality, you know, what home means, the way Bajaran describes homes, which is just simple things like his grandfather's beard on his cheek and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you know that, makes is, that makes as much of a world as a plot, and the world is you know, fresh and different and, and interesting. And I would say that the conditions, you know, why I into this diaspora thing is that the conditions in which we explore and share and these questions that we're asking of, when we apply that to narratives, they're just they're very different, they're very new, they're very expansive. Because one of the things is, at least what I see in Camargo, when we get together, you know, we're like, Oh, our, our, our people, you know, just like, you know, just like what, uh, you know, Bajiran says, I like to uh, talk to people who's thinking what I'm thinking, you know what I mean? We, uh, you know, the way in which we sort of share each other and that we're curious about each other and we have to accept each other's difference and complexities in order to have this conversation and we're very willing to do it. So the basic thing that sort of happens is the whole duality thing 
we don't even notice it anymore, right? You know, the, like, my way or the highway, this or that, right or wrong, that's just becomes something that's not of use to us. And that's kind of, I think that evokes a kind of narrative that the world needs. And I think we, uh, those people, are the ones to give it to them. Write it like it was, and spell it like Mavula wrote it. Oh, I'm, s I'm sorry, Mavula. Thank you so much for. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for Thank being here. You, it's you midnight know. my time. <laughs> Thank you, Mavula. <laughs> midnight Paris time. Thank you so much. We for love you. I love you too. <laughs> You enjoy the rest of your conversation and congrats on the festival, Carlisle and the whole team. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done? Comes off. <laughs>